Paul says this in Ephesians 6, 4, And fathers, and so this applies to all parents, not just fathers, but fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up, and that's a key word, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. The King James says, nurture and admonition of the Lord. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Thank you. Well, we're talking about dysfunctional families, and a few weeks ago, the last time that I was able to preach, I talked to you about the fact that all of us have dysfunctional families because basically all of us are flawed. All are sinners, all have come short of the glory of God, and all of us basically are dysfunctional. Now, I've got to tell you, when I was growing up, we didn't use the word dysfunctional. We used another D word, and the other D word was not dang, as in I'm going to kill those dang kids. It was a whole different D word. And that D word was not dysfunctional, it was the word delinquent. Remember that word delinquent? We hardly use it anymore. How many of you grew up in this area, and you know about a place called Jackson Training School in Concord, North Carolina? Do you know about that place? That's a place, when I was growing up, where juvenile delinquents would be sent. And my mom would threaten me whenever I did something wrong on those rare occasions, of course, when I did something wrong... And she would say, I'm going to send you to Jackson Training School. And just those words brought about repentance and agony in my soul and sackcloth and ashes. And you talk about crying and you talk about confessing. The last place in the world I wanted to go was to a juvenile hall called Jackson Training School. And so that was the word that was popular in my day. We didn't have dysfunctional kids. We just had plain old delinquents. So whether you use the word dysfunctional or delinquent or dang kids, whatever word or phrase you use, it reminds us that being a parent is a very tough job. Now, parents, have you ever thought about this? What kind of job description would be drawn up for parenting and for being a parent today? What would a job description for a parent really look like? Well, basically, we know that job descriptions have two aspects. First of all, on one side, you have the idea of what's required for the job, the attributes, the responsibilities, and so forth on one side. And then on the other side, the objectives. So you have the attributes, the kind of things that you need to have in your life if you're going to qualify to be a good parent. And what would you list as qualifications for being a good parent? Well, I think I'd put it at the top of my list, love, probably you as well, forgiveness, grace, patience, a whole lot of patience, firmness, backbone, and certainly every parent needs eyes in the back of their head, right? Because kids will always try to do those things behind your back just to push your buttons. And so we need eyes in the back of our heads. And those are the kinds of attributes I think every parent needs. Those are the kind of qualities every parent needs. But what about responsibilities? What would a job description deal with when it comes to responsibilities for all parents? Well, I believe three of them, and many could be listed, but three of them flow right out of Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. And I believe this is God's word for us as parents in the 21st century. And God's saying to us, these three things, these three responsibilities are absolutely essential if we're going to be good, godly, holy parents in a very unholy generation at this time. Now, the first thing on that list of objectives would be this. Parents shall let their children be children. Let your children be children children. Now, Paul says to parents, hey, moms and dads, don't stir up anger in your kids. I like the way other translations put that as well. They use a variety of words. For example, the New International Version says this, don't exasperate your children. Don't exasperate them. Don't frustrate them. The New American Standard puts it like this, don't provoke your children. And then the Amplified Bible puts it like this, don't irritate your children. But you get the idea. Don't frustrate. Don't exasperate. Don't irritate. Don't instill anger in your children while they're growing up. Now, can I tell you one way that parents do frustrate their children and exasperate them? And that one way, and there are many ways that can be listed, but that one way is that sometimes we as adults, we as parents, especially in this present culture, tend to look at our children as little tiny adults. 
we see them as adults in a child-sized body. And we think about them thinking like an adult, acting like an adult, making decisions like an adult, and sometimes we look at them like adults. But actually, that's not the case at all. They're not little adults squeezed into a small body. They're children. They're K-I-D-S. They are kids. And we need to accept that fact and let our children be children. We need to realize that. In our culture today, there's a strong, strong push on our children growing up way too fast. We want them to be a 4-0 student and a college graduate by the age of five and a half. And so from the earliest moment of birth, even before birth, we buy them computers and books and learning tools and all those things. And I'm not saying those things are wrong, but if you notice this, when you give your children, small children especially, computers and books and learning tools, what do they play with? The boxes that the stuff came in. Do you know why children play with the wrapping and the boxes and the bubble wrap inside all those things? It's because they are kids, K-I-D-S. It's because they're children. And we need to recognize the fact that, yes, they are children and allow them the privilege of being children. In our present hurry-up-and-grow-up world, it seems like children just have a very difficult time just being children children. We expect them to grow up so fast, and there's so much pressure on our kids to do that. And so many parents fall into this trap. When I was in the hospital this past week, I had the chance to watch a lot of television. Can I tell you there's nothing good on during the day on television, and very little that's on at night that's worth watching. But one program I was watching was talking about how there's so much pressure on parents to potty train their children. And it had video of parents taking little tiny babies about this big, and they're holding them over the commode, teaching them to potty train even when they're just a few weeks old. And it was talking about the pressure that puts on those little children. And they're not really ready for that step, but parents feel that pressure because sometimes they can't get in preschool until they're potty trained. And they have all this pressure trying to succeed. And it reminded me of what I'm talking about right now. There's a tremendous pressure in our society for our children to grow up way too fast. And we need to allow our children just to be children. Also in our culture, there's a lot of emphasis on sexual activity. And I was reading the other day about younger and younger children that are involved in sexual activity. I was reading, as a matter of fact, that by the time children are 15 years of age, 13% in our culture have already become sexually active. That's 13% of all the young people under the age of 15 are already sexually active. By the time they get to age 19, that leaps to 70%. Why? What happens between 15 and 19? They graduate from high school. They spend their first year away from home at college. They stretch their wings of liberty. And many get involved in sexual activity. And younger and younger people are getting involved sexually and are becoming sexually active. I read about one couple the other day. They're having a baby. The boy is 11 years of age, and I use that term boy. He's not a man yet. 11 years of age, the girl is 14, and they're going to be parents. In my estimation, they're still children, and yet they're going to have a child of their own, and that's the culture, the hurry-up, grow-up world that we're living in right now, and I believe we need to go back and take a fresh look at just letting our children simply be children. There's so much sexual innuendo. And so much sexual pressure, if you watch television, if you watch some of the programs, it seems like a couple of people meet together, a husband or a wife, and maybe they're married to somebody else, or maybe they're singles, and they meet each other, and in the next scene, they're already going to bed together. Over and over, we see that in the media, and it's coming off as normal, and that's putting pressure on our children. Last summer, I saw a little girl... She's probably eight, nine years of age, just a little girl, about this tall. She was with her parents, and she owned a pair of shorts, and on the back of the shorts, right on the back side, it said the word hot. Right on the back of those shorts, on that little tiny girl. Now, some people would say, isn't that cute? She's dressing like a big girl. I don't think it's cute at all. 
I don't think it's cute for little girls or big girls to wear anything like that because when you have something written in that area, guess what? That draws attention to that particular area. And we need to recognize there are perverts out there who are attracted even to the youngest of children. And I saw that and I thought to myself, if my daughter still lived at home and if she had a pair of shorts that said hot on the back, I'd run them through the shredder before sundown. We don't need things like that to add pressure. Our children need to be allowed to be children because that's basically what they are. Now, I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that say, well, brother, buddy, you just don't understand. These are the modern times, and people grow up a lot faster. I do understand that. But I think there's something to be said for our children being allowed the privilege to be children while it's okay for them to be children. So parents, let's make up our mind. Let's make up our mind right now. We're going to let our kids stay kids as long as they possibly can. Let them experience childhood. Let them imagine. Let them play. Let them use their imagination. Let them do things that children normally do. I'm convinced there are a lot of adults right now in our culture who are frustrated adults because they were forced by circumstances or by family or by peer pressure just to grow up way too fast. And they miss something in their childhood. And many times they resort to childish things trying to recapture something of what they missed when they were growing up. So let's let our kids be kids while they can be kids. Also, speaking of the fact that they're kids, the fact that they are children... They're not well-tuned yet when it comes to coordination. Now, some of us as big people aren't really well-tuned when it comes to coordination, I being the chief of sinners when it comes to that. But I want you to know that children have not really fine-tuned all their skills of coordination. And sometimes just because they're a kid, they can be clumsy. And sometimes just because they're a child, they can bump a glass of milk and knock it over and make a mess all over the table and all over the floor. Now, when I was raising my two children, and they were young, and they were at home, and they would knock over a glass of tea or a glass of Pepsi or something like that, sometimes, I hate to confess this, but sometimes I would get very upset. And I would say, look at this mess. Oh, it's all over the floor. It's all over the table. You're going to ruin the finish on the wood. And I'd get so upset. And I would forget that these were children. And one of the reasons they were clumsy is because they were still kids. And I believe God has a sense of humor because usually when I would get very upset like that and Pop would lose it, within a week or so, guess what he would do? I would bump a glass of tea or a glass of Diet Pepsi or something like that, and over it would go. And my kids would just look at me with those big brown eyes like, what are you going to do now, big man? I want you to know... We need to understand that kids are kids. It's okay for them to be kids. Let's let them be kids. Yes, we want them to grow. Yes, we want them to succeed. But at the same time, let's let them enjoy childhood while they can. I believe it's that important. And so I believe one of the great objectives of being a parent on the job description of parenthood would be let your children be children while it's okay for them to be children. That's a major thing. Here's the second thing I'd put on that list of objectives right out of Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. Parents shall let their children be corrected. Let their children be corrected. Notice what Paul says in this verse. Fathers, don't stir up the anger in your children. Don't exasperate them. Don't frustrate them. But bring them up in the nurture or training and admonition or instruction of the Lord. Now, that word nurture or training literally means to learn through discipline. In Hebrews chapter 12, speaking of Hebrews, we're talking about that book tonight. But in Hebrews chapter 12, the writer of Hebrews talks about the chastening of the Lord. This is the very same Greek word, chastening of the Lord, and the idea of bring them up in the nurture and training of the Lord. Literally, the word means to learn through discipline. Do you think that children in our culture need discipline today? Just watch children. Just observe children and parents at restaurants or maybe in the store or in the mall and see how children act and sometimes how parents are totally frustrated, have no idea what to do about correcting that child. And it seems like that discipline 
is sadly lacking in too many homes. Somebody put it like this. Everything in the modern home is run by switches except children. Amen? Everything's run by switches except children. And I believe that discipline is still important. Even switches. Even godly discipline when it comes to spanking. Not child abuse. I'm not talking about that at all. But I'm talking about godly biblical discipline. Now, why do children need discipline? Two reasons. First of all, every child is born with their own will. Every child has a will of their own. Secondly, every child is born with a sin nature. Now, I know it's hard to realize when you look into the face of that little baby and you see that love and how cuddly they are and they're ooing and they're aahing and you're looking at that little child. It's hard to imagine they have a sin nature. But give it a couple of days. I promise you, you'll recognize, yes, there is a sin nature there. And because they have a free will of their own, and because they have a sin nature, that's a double trouble situation. Because that leads them to do things that are wrong. It leads them to do things that are against you as a parent, and even against God Himself. Have you noticed you don't have to teach children how to do wrong? You don't have to teach them how to do wrong. You don't have to teach them how to pitch a fit. You don't have to teach them to have a spasitism, as my daughter used to say. You don't have to teach them how to do that. They come naturally knowing that because they have a free will of their own and they have a sin nature. That's why the Bible says, I was shapen in iniquity. I was born in sin. It doesn't mean that baby has sinned and if it dies, it's going to go to hell. But what it means is it has a sin nature because we all do. We inherited it from Adam. And every child has that free will and that sin nature, and that's double trouble for any parent. We have to teach our children how to do right. We have to say, listen, this is right, this is wrong. There are certain boundaries in life. And parents, I want you to know, it's our responsibility to establish the boundaries. Those children are not born with automatic boundaries. They don't know right from wrong. They know how to do wrong, but they need to be taught, disciplined to do what's right. And they're not born automatically with a sense of boundaries. And they're not able to choose as a child what the proper boundaries are. They don't know enough to really make those kinds of decisions for themselves. And that's why God gave every child parents. Every child has parents. They may not be together. They may not be living under the same roof. But in every situation where there's a child somewhere, there's a man and there's a woman. And God ideally gave every child parents in order to raise them, to nurture them, to train them, to help them to learn through discipline and to establish the boundaries in life. And it's our job to establish those boundaries. One lady made this comment, and I quote, she said, I grew up and I never knew how far I could go. Because my parents never cared enough to tell me. And I thought because it wasn't important to them, it's not important to me. And I believe there are many parents right now, even parents in our churches, that are not establishing clear-cut boundaries for their children. And somehow they're leaving it up to the school or to somebody else or to psychologists or just to the child themselves to make their own choices in life. And I want you to know that is not biblical. We as parents are to establish the boundaries. Let me read you what one set of parents had as their idea about parenting. They said that their children could hang out with anybody they wanted to hang out with as they grew up. They said that their children could watch anything they wanted to in terms of television and movies. They said that their children were going to be liberal and free and they could click anything on the internet that they wanted to click on. They said that their children were going to be broad-minded and they could explore any sexual activity they wanted to, whatever their desire was. They said they wanted their children to really be wise in terms of 21st century wisdom. And they were going to raise their children that actions have no consequences at all. Do you know who those parents are? Those parents are Ozzy and Sharon Osbourne. They said we're going to let our children make their own choices. In fact, Ozzy Osbourne made this statement. He said, the only time I ever talked to my children about alcohol and drugs was when I asked them, can I have some? And friends, I want to tell you something. That's the wrong way to parent. 
That's the wrong way to parent. No boundaries at all. And I believe God holds us responsible as parents, as adults, to really establish the boundaries for our children and say, this is right, this is wrong. If you cross this line, you enter the territory of wrongness and there will be consequences for your actions. And you say, well, that's Ozzy Osbourne. That's an extreme case. I know people, I know Christian parents right now, I could name them for you, who say, listen, I'm going to provide booze for my kids because I know they're going to drink anyway, and I just assume they drink under my roof then go out somewhere else and drink. So I'm going to provide alcohol for them. And they can sleep over with their boyfriend or girlfriend because I know they're going to do it anyway. And so I'm going to allow them to do it at my house. I know so-called Christian parents who are living that way and parenting that way. If you've done that as a parent, if that's where you are, you have caved. And you have refused to establish the boundaries and you've removed those boundary markers that God wants you to put in place as a parent. And it's not the right way to parent. Now, boundaries are very, very important. But that's just one part of the picture. Once we put the boundaries in place, we've got to make up our mind, parents. What are we going to do when the kids push against those boundaries? When they overstep those bounds? When they really test to see if those boundaries are real, and I want to promise you up front, they will do that. As they get older and older and older, they will test those boundaries to see if you mean what you say, if those boundaries really are important to you, and what you're going to do about it if they don't abide by the boundaries that you've established as a parent. And I believe that's where discipline comes into the picture. And the Bible talks about discipline. It talks about that. In fact, that's what the word nurture is all about. It's nurture. It's training. It's learning through discipline. And the Bible does teach that we teach our children, we teach our children by applying the Board of Education to the seat of their understanding. Amen? And the Bible talks about that. Now, many people would say, oh, Pastor Buddy, what about child abuse? It's not child abuse. I think it's abuse not to give a child a spanking every once in a while just to let them know these are the boundaries. We're going to reinforce these boundaries. There are consequences to your action. I'm not talking about abusing a kid, but I am talking about reinforcing the authority of the parent in the home. And the Bible teaches that over and over again. Here's what I believe. I believe there are a whole bunch of children in our culture today who don't need more counseling, a whole lot of children who don't need more medication, a whole lot of children who just need a good old spanking, good old discipline. And that's what the Bible teaches. Now, some people would say to me, well, we can't control our child. Five years old, and his name is Johnny Destructo, and we just can't control little Johnny Destructo. And I'm always amazed at that because I look at those two parents, and between the two of them, they're packing 200 pounds at least. 120 pounds for the lady, 180 pounds for the guy. That's over 200, 300 pounds. 300 pounds of humanity, and you've got a 5-year-old, 45, 50 pounds, and you're telling me 300 pounds of adult can't control 45 pounds of child? What is wrong with that picture? We need to get back to what the Bible says, that parents are in charge in the home. Now, parents, have you been taught that you're not really in charge? You're just a facilitator. You're just there to provide and make sure everything goes smoothly and little Johnny Destructo and Gertrude Whirlwind gets their way. If that's what you've been taught, you've been taught wrong. You need to understand you are in charge. One of my favorite writers, and I'm going to quote him again next Sunday, the Lord willing, is John Roseman. He writes in the Charlotte Observer about family, and John's got some great books. He's a Christian, became a believer a few years ago through Lee Strobel's books about uh, the Christ, the case for Christ and so forth, but a great Christian guy. And here's what John Roseman says. He says, the problem with parents today is this, that we believe in love and friendship with our children. Love and friendship what children need is not love and friendship, but love and leadership. They don't need another 35, 40-year-old friend. What they need is a parent with backbone, with guts, with firmness. 
They need a parent who's willing to stand up and say, these are the boundaries. Our family is going to live by these boundaries. Now, I've met some other parents, and they say, well, you know, we love our little child, Johnny Destructo. We love him so very, very much, and we just love him too much to spank him. We really do, Pastor. You know, that's not true. They don't love little Johnny too much to spank him. They love themselves too much to take the time and make the effort. Because when you discipline a child the way the Bible talks about, it takes time. It takes time to affirm that child, to say, I love you. This is going to hurt me more than it hurts you, but here it goes anyway. It takes time. And so many parents are limited on their time, and we can't pull ourselves away from the computer, away from Facebook, away from Twitter. We can't pull ourselves away from television long enough. We can't pull ourselves away from business long enough to discipline our children. I want to tell you, parents, our children need to be corrected. We're raising a generation of renegades who know nothing of respect for law and authority in the classroom or anywhere else because they never learned it at home. And if they don't learn it at home, guess what? They're not going to learn it at school. They're not going to learn it with the police department. They're not going to learn it out there in the world with peer pressure. They've got to learn it at home. And so, parents, here's one of our objectives. We need to make sure that our children are corrected. One other thing that I think is an objective on the job description of a parent would be this. And I think the Bible makes this clear in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. Parents shall also, also let their children be Christians. Let them be Christians. Now Paul puts it this way. He says, raise up your children in the nurture, discipline, learning, and admonition or instruction in the Lord. Raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. This word admonition simply means encouragement and instruction. Raise them up in the nurture, in the admonition, in the encouragement, in the instruction of the Lord. What's the greatest goal of parenting for Christians? What do you think that would be? Well, some Christian parents would say this. We want to raise our children and Make sure they get a good education so they can get a good job and make lots of money. That's our number one objective. Others would say, no, we want to raise our children up so they can be really good at athletics or maybe good at scholastics or maybe good in academia. We want to raise our children up so they can be successful in life in one of these areas. And those are worthy goals. But I believe there's something even greater than that for Christian parents in the Lord. And that is that we need to raise our children. We need to instruct them. We need to train them. We need to encourage them so that they can make an intelligent, informed decision about their personal relationship with Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Can you name anything that's more important than that? Than teaching our children and admonishing our children and encouraging our children so that as they grow up, They are open to the Lord Jesus Christ, and they know how important a relationship is with them. As Christian parents, that should be our number one objective. Now, a lot of parents would not agree with that, and a lot of parents would say, well, you know, Pastor Buddy, we just don't want to force our children to receive Jesus. We want them to grow up and make their own decision about Christ. We don't want to force anything on them at all. Well, let me ask you this. How can they grow up and make a really informed, intelligent decision about Jesus if they never hear anything about Him? How can they grow up and make a really intelligent, informed decision about Christ if they never know anything about Christ and Christianity versus other religions around the world? How can they make a decision like that? And I would say to a parent who has that attitude in life, do you practice that when it comes to education? Do you say, well, we don't want to force little Johnny Destructo to go to school. We don't want to force Gertrude Whirlwind to go to school. We want them to make their own decision about education. And so we're not going to force them to do anything. Would you do that in terms of education? No parent would. And if you did, you'd be in trouble with the state for truancy. And that's rightly so. 
We need to make sure our children get a good education, the best they possibly can. Let me ask a parent who also has that attitude this question. Would you follow that same line of reasoning when it comes to medical and dental attention? Would you say, well, you know, we don't want to force anything on our little boy, our little girl. And so we're not going to make them go to the doctor. And we're not going to make them go to the pediatrician. And we're not going to make them go to the dentist. We're going to let them grow up and make their own decision. You're going to grow up with an unhealthy, toothless child if you do that. No right-thinking parent would do that. Now, I want to tell you something. When it comes to Christianity, it's even more important than education and medical and dental situations. Because when we deal with Christianity, we're dealing with the eternal soul. That part of that child that's going to live forever and forever and forever. Now, here's another factor for those parents who have that attitude. I'm not going to force my kids to go to church. I'm not going to force Jesus down their throat. I'm not going to force them to be exposed to Christ. They can make their own decision. Did you know that most people that are saved are saved prior to the age of 14? Most people right now collectively across the body of Christ that are saved are saved before the age of 14. Here's the way that breaks down. Between the ages of 5 and 13... There's a 32% probability that a person will be saved. Between the ages of 5 and 13, a 32% probability they'll be saved. When that child turns 14 years of age, that probability drops to 4%. Above the age of 19, it only increases to 6%. What does that mean, preacher? That means if we're going to reach people at the optimum time, we need to reach them while they are, say it with me, children. They are most open at that time. They've not become set in their ways and stubborn. They haven't been affected by all the educational processes out there that are anti-Christ and anti-biblical and anti-Lord. And because of that, they are most open when they're younger. And there's a 32% probability that children under the age of 13 will give their heart to Christ. Now, if a parent says, I'm not going to force religion down their throat, they're going to make up their own mind, they are literally robbing their children of the optimum time to respond to Jesus. And I believe there's going to be a lot of frustrated kids who are going to grow up and say, Mom and Dad, why didn't you tell me about Jesus? Why didn't you show me Jesus with your life and tell me about Jesus with your lip? And I want to tell you, it's not enough just to tell them with our lip. We do need to show them with our life. If we tell them with our lip, Jesus is important, but we don't show the importance of Jesus in our own life, that will frustrate them and exasperate them as well. And Paul says, don't exasperate your children. Don't frustrate your children. I believe there are going to be a lot of people at the judgment of Almighty God. And I believe at that judgment, there are going to be a lot of children who have grown up with no influence of Christianity, and they're going to point their finger at their parents at the judgment and say, why didn't you tell me about Jesus? Why didn't you give me the chance to go to Sunday school and church and through your personal life to know about Jesus? Why did you rob me of that opportunity because I grew up without Christ and now I'm being sent to a devil's hell? Why? Talk about the ultimate frustration. I want to share one little word with you before we close. One little word. And if you're not careful, you might just read right past it. Paul says this. He says, bring up, U-P, bring up a child. Bring up a child. Raise up a child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Up. That same word up is repeated in Proverbs chapter 22, where Proverbs 22 says, train up. A child. I think that little word, two letters, one syllable, is very significant. Raise up. Train up. I believe the ultimate goal of parenting is to point our children upward. Upward. Not to bring them down. Not to put them down. Not to tear them down. But to point them upward to Jesus Christ to point them upward to faith in Christ and how important that is, and also to point them upward to a higher level of living called the Christian life.
Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And ladies and gentlemen, as parents and grandparents, if we don't provide that training upward for our children, we're cheating them out of the greatest blessing of life. Our children need to be allowed to be Christians. Now this morning, maybe you're here as a frustrated parent, and maybe you say, Pastor, I don't know where to turn. Man, we got this problem at our house, whatever it may be, you fill in the blank. And we just need outside help. We need God's assistance. Remember that song that was sung just a while ago? It comes from Joshua. As for me and my house, we will what? Serve the Lord. Would you make that declaration this morning? I mean, draw that line in the sand. As for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. We're tired of doing it the world's way. We're going to do it God's way. And maybe you need to come make that commitment as a mom or a dad or Maybe both parents need to come and say, we're going to make that commitment to the Lord. It's tough being a parent. I know that it is. I don't mean to oversimplify it. But God's way is still the best way. Maybe in your house, you've got a prodigal son or daughter. Many of us do. And maybe you prayed and your heart's been broken and you shed tears over that child. Would you come and pray today and just say, Lord, I'm trusting you to bring that child, that boy, that girl, back to those things that I tried to teach them. I believe if your child grows up and accepts Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and serves the Lord in their life, even though they rebel before they get there, I believe if that's true of your children, then you are indeed a successful parent in the eyes of God. Very successful. Would you come and make a prayer for your family today? If you're not saved, that's the most important thing. Would you come and give your heart to Christ today as a parent, as a child? That will make a difference in your home, a significant difference. Let's stand together, every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, thank you so much for your plan for the family. And Lord, we know this is an ancient plan. It goes back to the first century. And yet, Lord, we still believe that it works today. And Father, I want to pray for every parent who's here today, every mom and every dad, every single mom, every single dad. Lord, I know that it must be tough, especially in those categories. And Lord, I pray, O oh God, you'd instill wisdom and give grace and give strength. And Lord, help us to take charge in our homes as you would see us and would want us to do. Father, we love you. Thank you for our families. And bless them and heal them. And help them to be more of what you want them to be. For your praise and for your glory.